And we're now ready to begin. I'm going to introduce once again our panelists in order of their appearance. First, Kevin E. Wisely, Director of the New York State Office of Emergency Management of the New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, and, uh, and also uh, Director, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Emergency Services for uh, New York State DHSES, so it's, uh, it's quite a range of responsibilities that Kevin has. Paul Cayano, a uh, meteorologist for WNYT here in Albany. You hear him in the morning, uh, either on radio or on television, and he is also a proud University at Albany graduate. We should mention that, Paul, thank you. Jerry Brodsky, project director for the New York State Mesonet at the University at Albany. Everett Joseph, director of the Atmospheric Sciences Research Center at the University at Albany, and Howard M. Goebel, canal hydrologist for the New York State Canal Corporation. Before we begin and before I call Kevin up, I just want to indicate that, uh, that he will not be able to re remain with us for the duration of panel two. And so if you have any questions, we're going to take his questions immediately after his presentation and before we move into Paul's presentation. So without further ado, Kevin, please. Thank you, Bob, appreciate the introduction. Oh. So we want to talk a little bit about severe weather forecasting and how it impacts emergency services decision making. We heard a lot of things uh, this morning in the first panel uh, that are important information, it, that we're gathering information. And Mr. Thorncroft spoke about his loaded dice and we as emergency managers would like that those dice really loaded so that we can get good information um, so that it contributes to our decision making. Mr. Bozart and Mr. Lavalley talked about the undulating patterns of our weather and how that um, impacts some of the forecasting and some of the views and the decisions that go into assessing probabilities. Those things all have an impact on what we're doing and what we do as emergency managers because it's very important that we have that information um, as we start to plan and prepare for the varying events that uh, occur. The importance of probabilistic information at a very high level, just information. When we look and we think about things of severity and extent and precipitation levels and river and creek flood gauges, snowfall amounts and the rate per hour, all just a, a snapshot of items that really impact some of the decisions that we make in emergency services and emergency management as we try to prepare to protect as best we can the citizens of the state of New York. Um, Things such as on the right hand side, you know, stockpile equipment, resources and assets that we have available to us that we can pre-deploy to ensure that we are fully prepared to deal with the type of an event. Pre-staging of assets if it's necessary, depending on the severity and the magnitude of uh, an event, uh, we may pre-stage certain assets. We may have to relocate assets as the event transponds. or tran is starts to develop over time and we start to see the impacts. Um, we start to look at pre-planning coordination um, with local preparedness and response entities. It's so important that even down at the grassroots level, those local, those counties, those cities and towns and villages, they all have folks that are focused on preparedness and planning and emergency uh, response to deal with these types of events. So the more information, the more understanding of what is going to occur and what that magnitude is, um, is going to be so important and it's so helpful to them. So that's why it is so important that we have these discussions, that the, uh, uh, the colleagues here that are working on gathering this information, continuing to enhance this, this, this information is so important. We look at some of the particular events that we've had in recent times, and we've talked about some of these already today. Um, Hurricane Irene, such a sizable event that occurred that impacted a large portion um, of eastern New York State. Uh, you can see by the magnitude and the, and the size of the event how important it is for us to understand what's going to be occurring, what's going to be happening, so that we can then make some decisions. These events cause traumatic loss, not only to potentially life, but to physical property, to communities, to entire villages that may be wiped out by these events, all needing a response and subsequent recovery from that. 
Um, so it's important that we continue to understand and know the challenges that we're going to face and any types of predictions. And some of the esteemed colleagues will talk about later on in the second panel, the things that we can do to gather information to help us with decision making to prepare for these events. Um, Tropical Storm Lee came right behind um, uh, Irene. Again, another swath of the state of New York that was impacted very heavily by a weather event, a severe weather event in our state that um, directs and takes resources, assets, personnel to respond to these events. So the more that we can be prepared on the front end to understand what the impacts might be, the better off we are to um, prepare and save lives, save property, ensure that we have the right things in place so that folks are not as severely impacted. When we look at these types of events, we start to look at what kinds of things we can deploy. And this is just a snapshot of pre-event type activities, generators, light towers. If we think we're going to have some type of an event that uh, is going to, I saw the blue screen in the corner of my eye and I thought something happened. Um, you know, perhaps we have events that we may lose power, that we may have uh, um, an area that we're going to need to be able to ensure that people, um, that we can see and deal with things in off hours. We respond to different types of events with pumps and water tankers, communications equipment, um, even our incident management teams that we may pre-deploy to help a county with their logistics and their planning just as they start to operate and try to set up their emergency operations centers and their area operations centers. Deploying that personnel and those assets are so important to helping the community come back. And then post-event, we have, we're have we dealing with and working on disaster recovery centers, food and water, shelter. All of those things are thought about as we begin to prepare for the various weather and storm seasons that we have in the state of New York. And they've uh, it's an ongoing daily activity in the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services now because we have seen such a high frequency of these types of events. Um, we all know uh, about and have read and have seen and probably the, uh, many of you in this room were very much involved in Hurricane Sandy response and or recovery and we still are dealing with Hurricane Sandy today. Those are the magnitude and scope and understanding ahead of time the sheer magnitude and force of this event um, and what it's going to mean versus the, um, the, the rainfall and the landfall of the pattern versus the coastal impacts and the storm surge that in the state of New York we were greatly impacted by. Again, this is all to highlight why all of this is so important for the folks that are here talking about forecasting data, meteorological data, and understanding that probabilistic information um, that we use to help us with decisions so that we can then respond and understand whether it's the flooding um, of a complete area or whether it's uh, uh, flooding and then the subsequent fire that burns out an entire community in the city of New York um, because of the access problem. So we're trying to understand and be better prepared to manage these situations. We all have seen many of these pictures before. Um, we know what the impacts were, but they all have a certain meaning. They all have a component of a response, of a dealing with the situation, and if we can be better prepared before these things happen, the better off we're, we're going to be. You know, for these big, bigger types of events, again, same type of snapshot, which have pre-event deployment of equipment, you have response to the event, you have post-event operations that are going on, all things that are triggered by forecasting and probabilities and then the subsequent decisions that we need to do to respond. You know, then a few months later after Sandy was Winter Storm Nemo, another monumental storm that impacted and a community that doesn't typically get this amount of snowfall that you would see. Um, 30 inches of snow is quite an impact to Suffolk County, New York. 30 inches of snow is just a, a warm summer day in the Tug Hill up in the, up upstate New York. Okay, so but those different impacts play into it. Very much like just recently, we, um, we talked to earlier about the, uh, um, the winter storm impacts in January downstate. 
and that path and, the, and where that was going to travel, the, the big impact was assumed going to be in New York City, it went out a little more easterly out to Suffolk County. That snowfall, um, even in a small scale in an area like Suffolk, is different than having a snowfall of that same magnitude in Syracuse. They're prepared for that kind of stuff. They know, they do snow. Suffolk, Suffolk County doesn't have the resources, the equipment. They may have had some, a lot of experience in recent time, but they still don't have the resources and the assets um, to deal with it at such a magnitude and such a short duration of time. So we, as emergency managers, prepare and plan and look at those types of things, not only um, what the forecast is and what the precipitation levels are going to be, what the impacts are going to be, but where that's going to hit in the state. What area is going to be impacted? What area is better prepared than others to deal with the different types of um, precipitation that we see? So that's part of that decision making that goes in. Again, another quick snapshot of um, uh, resources, pre-event, response to an event, all things that impact our decision making. This past uh, November, we've already talked a little bit about the impacts of the Buffalo snow, uh, November out in Erie County. Um, that was quite an event uh, and the impacts to that because it had two really distinct separate components. We had the, the cold and the snow and the impact of people being stuck in their homes and being um, not able to navigate the roadways to a transition uh, within a week later of the potential for the warming, and it did warm up, and we had a massive snow melt, and the breakup of the snow on the rivers and creeks, and the flooding that was potentially um, going to occur. So all of that information, we stayed in constant contact with you know, forecasters and meteorologists to determine how that was going to, and what the, where, when and where the, the warming was, to, was going to occur because in areas you had up to seven feet of snow that a few days later um, you were gonna have a melt and all of that precipitation and water content within the snow was now going to need to go somewhere. And it's gonna fill up the creeks and the streams. Um, and we had, so there's areas in that area, southern area county that um, flood. And also that this type of an event of that magnitude of short duration takes so many resources to respond to and to deal with that situation. We saw some other shots of the shoveling of roofs and um, also it's unique. I happened to be out in Erie County for that event and it's uh, something I never thought I'd ever see. People shoveling their roofs on their homes and needing to throw the snow in the air to get it off the roof because the piles were already so high above their roof line, so single story homes, um, just to ensure that we didn't have continued collapses. Um, and we did unfortunately have a number of collapses, but those are the things that we start to, to deal with and have to manage. And again, resources get deployed pre-event, during the event, and post-event, all to help manage this situation. So I, was, I wanted to today to just come and say a few words to just you know highlight the fact that this is so important. Um, it's, uh, wonderful at the University of Albany and Rockefeller Institute to put this together to bring in colleagues that ultimately we all have the same common goal. What are we going to, what can we do to help the citizens of the state of New York? What are we going to do to help prepare one another? What can we do as individual citizens to prepare, to better prepare ourselves? Because our preparedness goes so far towards that response and that recovery uh, when we're dealing with these types of situations. Uh, so thank you, and I appreciate the time and effort for, for being here. Thanks. Can you take a couple questions? If there are a couple of questions, I'd be glad to entertain those now. Otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your session. Thanks, Thanks Russell. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So yeah. Great. Right. <laughs> Morning. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone at the University of Albany for inviting me back to speak here uh, on such an important day. Um, uh, it was mentioned that I am a former student here at the University of Albany Department of Atmospheric Science and. Uh, 
And uh, I'm a proud student. I'm, I'm happy to be back and talking about some of the things that I've learned, uh, not only at the university, but uh, again, uh, since then, as so many things have, have uh, changed in the weather forecasting industry and for, for different reasons. I want to talk about uh, probabilistic forecasting. Also, uh, it's been a hot topic here, and for good reason. It's, it seems like this is sort of the trend on, in, in forecasting to make people more aware of not only what we think is going to happen, but what the chances of some of the outlying things happening are. And uh, some of the changes over the last 25 years uh, one of the big ones, of course, about 25 years ago was the implementation of Doppler radar. Uh, but Doppler radar, it changed our short-term forecasts uh, of severe thunderstorms and uh, wind damage and hail and lightning. And it, and it made us as a whole, not only in the, in the TV industry, of course, but National Weather Service and all forecasting, it, it gave us a little bit more lead time to help protect life and property and, and it was a game changer and it did a dramatic job but I think the perception and, and I'm going to talk a lot about the perception of the general public a lot of what uh, we've been talking about here today has been how different agencies and the government help other agencies to then go out and do what they need to do to help people in the event of uh, disastrous weather or severe weather well, well I think I'm going to talk more about what the public needs to do or what the public perceives or sees when they see a forecast. That's I'm on the front line, so to speak, with in the TV industry in dealing with the public and, and what they see when they see a forecast and what they tend to believe. So the Doppler radar, everyone's got it on their mind, oh, you guys must be great because you have this Doppler radar, you can, you can tell me if uh, you know, next month is gonna be warmer or colder than normal. I mean, the Doppler radar doesn't do that. Doppler radar helps us in, in the very short term, zero to 12 hours, and to tell us whether we're gonna have severe weather, particularly thunderstorms, but also in the cold season, winter storms, and uh, small scale snow bands that can drop one, two, three inches an hour, in the case of lake effect snow, even more. But Doppler radar helps little with the 12 to 48 hour forecasts, the uh, short range forecasts. And that's when we turn to things like the Mesonet, which we've talked about also, and high resolution models, uh, supercomputers and technology over the last, especially 10 to 15, but even 20 to 25 years have allowed us to uh, produce uh, smaller scale, scale models, which can give us more accurate representations of what, can, what are gonna happen uh, weather-wise over that range of time. But, they have limitations as well. We don't really run those out to the long term. So I want to focus on the longer term, three to seven day forecast. The skill level for us has improved in the three to seven day range. I think it was 25 years ago, you didn't even see a seven day forecast. Most TV stations had four day forecast, five day forecast, but uh, you know, a couple of ambitious stations went out to seven and 10 days, probably just because of their channel number, but they did it anyway. <laughs> And it kind of followed suit. The rest of us had to do the same thing. And we got better at it, but I think that people, when they see it, they think it's gospel. They, they, they see it way out, and you can uh, change the screen. This is a sample of the seven-day planner that you'll see at WMYT where I work. And take those last few days, and people are making their plans for the weekend, and they see some snowflakes in there. They see it windy. But... That changes, that changes tomorrow, that changes the next day. And how do people react when they see that change? Or do they even bother looking for that change? I wanna focus on the Friday part of this forecast. Because you see a little bit of everything there. You see a sun, you see a bunch of snow, and then you see a 30%. What does that 30% mean? And I think, I think that's the big question. Because in the old days of television, you used to see this, and you still do, at the end of the forecast. And you say, oh, 30% chance of snow Friday, have a nice day. And people would think, well, I have plans on Friday, what am I gonna do? Well, what they used to do is tune back in later that day for the, I'm on in the morning, so the evening news, or, and or, they wake up the next morning and they see how that may have changed. Well, people really, they don't do that anymore. I think the public awareness of storm potential has increased dramatically 
in especially the last five to 10 years. It's all over the news and with the internet and a lot of different resources are now putting things out there. So when the news goes off for the moment, people go run to find more information about what they just heard. So the media can be a double-edged sword in getting the word out, particularly about storms, because many outlets, they give you the information, but they also want you to come back to them. So the hype factor gets increased a bit. And whether it's inadvertent or on purpose, it happens. And then you start ratcheting up everyone in their mind, the public, about, oh my God, there's a storm coming on Friday. But it was 30% chance, right? So does that mean it's, it's, a, it's a definite? Or does that mean that we can miss it? And you're starting to kind of think how people think out there. Everyone has an array of, of ideas of what's going to happen. So what we want to do is we want to sort of compress what we tell everyone into just the useful information. Another aspect of it is social media, which is a very powerful tool, as we all know. But it's still the Wild West out there with social media, and it probably always will be. There's nobody policing social media. So what you put out there is what's out there. It's up to every one of us to decide what we want to believe when it comes to social media, and obviously that goes with an array of topics, but specifically weather. You'll see all kinds of different forecasts for different storms that are coming. And I want to point one out in particular. There, there was a storm, not this past winter, but the winter before. And, and I call it a storm. It, it never even really happened. But there, there was one computer model that for 10 days in advance, it forecasted 30 inches of snow from the corridor just outside of the nation's capital uh, through Philadelphia and most of New Jersey into southern Long Island. 30 inches of snow. And, and some people have access to this information, and a lot more people do now than ever through the internet. They subscribe to services, and they see the computer models that it used to be just meteorologists cared to look at. But now the general public does, and there are some hobbyists, some people who, who love the weather, but they're not trained in forecasting the weather. And what they do is they post this information. But this isn't a real forecast. This is just a one snapshot from one model of what might happen if everything comes together perfectly. But then that gets picked up by different agencies. And in this case, you can see the Delmarva firefighter forums posted this with the idea that this was going to happen. And this is still 10 days away. And any meteorologist worth anything will tell you a 10-day forecast is very, very tricky. You have to be a brave person to go out and say that's going to happen. But that was shared on Facebook almost 42,000 times by in just that one site. That's not to say everyone else who had seen this. So the people who saw this forecast probably exceeded 100, 200,000, probably more people. And the National Weather Service started getting phone calls. All the TV stations started to get phone calls. What are we going to do? What's going to happen with this storm? But this was all fictitious. A lot of places were spending their valuable time answering calls from the public about this storm that wasn't certainly a guarantee. So my job in the media, I think, nowadays, more than anything else, is to get the word out uh, to the public. And we want to get it out in a responsible way. We still want to maintain the integrity of our forecast, so we don't want to say, oh yeah, that fifth day and sixth day, this is definitely going to happen. But we know people are going to get that information from somewhere, so we want to try to stay ahead of the perception generated by the hype, not only from some media outlets, but from social media, where there's a lot of information. So in comes the popular phrase of the day, probabilistic forecast. So now, what the idea is, is to give the public an idea of what we're seeing. You have all of these computer models. Supercomputers allow us to run uh, so many different computer models over and over again, and we can see the different outputs. You saw them in the presentations by my colleagues here. And it's up to us to determine what the highest percentage chance of of certain things are. But that's not to say the public can't handle knowing what might happen as an outlier on one side or the other. If a small number of computer models hint at a severe or a significant event, how do we handle this? 
So I posed this question to my viewers on the air and online. I said, you know, if I saw something in one of these computer models that hinted at a storm, would you want to know about it? And obviously the overwhelming answer was yes. People would love to know about that, but you have to kind of reel it in, keep it on a short leash because it's not a guarantee. So we want to make the public aware that we know about the possibility of a significant event. But when you deal with the public, I'm not always dealing with other scientists who uh, can handle certain information because they're qualified and, they're, and, and, and they have a background. So we have to keep it more simple. We have to be transparent. You now know what I see. This is what I'm doing when I make my forecast. It's not just a number, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise. It's a, it's, it, there's a process going on. And we wanna deliver that in a way that's easy to understand for people. People no longer are just accepting the fact that there might be a storm in five days. They tune in to hear about that storm. So when we used to give the forecast, it used to be in chronological order. We'd come on, temperature's 40 degrees, later on it's gonna be 50 degrees, tomorrow's gonna be 70, and it may rain the next day. Oh yeah, and there might be a snowstorm on Saturday. I'll talk about that tomorrow. It doesn't work anymore. So what I tried to do, and, I, and, and the next slide is an example. It was the first time I used it. It was this past um, November. It was the week before Thanksgiving. And woke up and I looked at the computer models and there was one computer model that said the Wednesday after, so that's the big travel day before Thanksgiving, there's gonna be a snowstorm. But that was just that one computer model. So what I decided to do was make a very, very simple graph and show it right at the beginning of the weather segment of the news. Not waiting till the end and, and, and just mention it for a moment. But right at the beginning I said, you probably heard or you will today that next Wednesday there's a chance of a snowstorm. But we have a lot of computer models, not just one. There's only one and a handful of them are, are, are suggesting it might happen where we can get a decent sized snowstorm. So the probability of that happening is low. Remember, there's a lot of computer models out there that are saying, no, there's not gonna be a storm that day. So how do we handle this? The probability is low, but if this happens, the impacts can be huge. Why? It's the biggest travel day of the year. So yes, we wanna inform the public that their day, their travel, or whatever they have going on on that day may be disrupted by a significant snowstorm but we also want to emphasize the probability being low. So if we can move on, we'll go a little bit more quickly. Two days out, the other computer models agreed, and luckily the probability came up with the impacts, and we had a big storm that day before Thanksgiving. So um, I think overwhelmingly it was successful that one little venture, or the first venture I had into using a probabilistic forecast for the general public, and, and the feedback that I got was, was great. The viewers loved it. They said, let's you know, give me more of this. So I tried to do it in a different way. This was that New York City snowstorm, or the one that Lance was talking about, uh, that just skimmed New York City. For Albany, up to 24 hours before, a couple of computer models were forecasting huge snowfall amounts, but others were saying, no, nah, just a couple of inches. So what do you believe? But my whole thing about this probabilistic forecast is you have to be upfront with the public, especially when you do what I do when you're on television. It's, you wanna make that deterministic forecast, say this is going to happen. But I think people can understand and, and the learning curve is there, but we can, we can get to it about making forecasts that, that where people understand that there are more, there could be more than one choice. And I think as long as I show them what I'm seeing, then you tend to build trust. And that's the, that's the big thing, especially when you're dealing with the public. Be the source for accurate information. So when the next Sandy comes, when the next Irene is on the long range maps, or Lee, that they come and turn to the source that they know that they can trust. Now you can go to social media for, our, for updates and, and other things, but, but you have to know that that type of stuff and the public needs to be aware that there's a lot of things they're gonna see on there that may not be true. So uh, even though the news has uh, desensitized some people towards severe weather, 
Uh, we tend to get out there every time there's a storm and, and bang the drum. We want everybody to be prepared. So people are less likely to pay attention when you do that. So I say less is more. Uh, only get out there when you do have a significant weather event. And we've talked about uh, the increasing possibility or probability of this happening due to all the different uh, scientific things like the climate change. And, and so in the future, instead of getting out there a hundred times, let's make the times that we get out there and talk about the serious storms less so people pay attention to us more. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. It's always tough to follow a TV meteorologist. <laughs> I'll say, say that right now. Um, Everett and I just love talking about the mesonid, and so we're actually going to tag team on this presentation. I'll provide an overview of uh, the New York State mezzanine and what that is and, and what we have planned, and then Everett will follow up with sort of a discussion of how we will apply the system to emergency management and decision making. So as to get this slide up, let me just ask the question, what is a mezzanine? Well, a mesonet is, the term is a, composed of two words, mesoscale network. And mesoscale refers to the weather phenomena roughly a couple of miles up to just over 100 miles in size. And so that includes everything from thunderstorms to fronts to, to anything that might impact the state on a, on a large scale. And so you combine that with, a, if you want to design a network that captures that phenomena, then uh, you space your stations accordingly. And so for New York State, we plan a, a network of 125 stations across the state. And, and so we'll come, you know, when you combine that information with radar, or vertical sounding information, uh, which we'll also collect with this mesonet, then you create a 3D view or 3D image of what's going on in the weather across the state at any one time. And so all of our data will collect um, will be uh, collected every five min minutes and pulled together and uh, simulated and provided in your numerical forecast models. And so that's the plan moving forward. Just a little about the time scale. We expect to identify all 125 sites by the end of this year and we expect to have the entire network installed by the end of next year. And so as we, as we bring those stations online We'll uh, make that data available to the public, um, hopefully within a few weeks after installation of that particular site. We'll have at least one county, or one station per county, and if you're a large county, you'll have a couple of stations. And uh, <laughs> just a little about uh, the equipment that we plan to have, and I'll show pictures of this. All 125 stations will have. Uh, we'll, we'll measure the, what we call the basic suite of variables. Uh, precipitation, temperature, wind speed and direction, uh, atmospheric pressure, and solar radiation as well as um, soil moisture and soil temperature at three levels. And we have a subnetwork of uh, snowfall, of uh, snow data, so 20 sites across the network will measure snowfall and what we call the snow water equivalent, which will help with uh, hydrology. And we'll also have what we call 17 enhanced sites that will, will have what we call LIDAR and microwave profilers. And they'll provide vertical profiles every five minutes of wind, temperature, and moisture. And so those are critical components for numerical forecasting. It really doesn't have a whole lot of information above the surface. The one advantage of a network like this is that, uh, particularly for New York, where the state where you have a lot of complex terrain, you're helping to fill in a lot of those gaps that we have in the current system. Radars are great. We have six uh, next ranch that cover the state of New York. Um, but in complex terrain, you're missing a lot of the low levels, and especially in the mountainous areas. And so if you have a, a case such as uh, Irene or Lee, you're, you're kind of blind in a sense because the radar is overshooting a lot of those high impact areas. And so a, a network of rain gauges of a, a dense network of rain gauges can help fill in a lot of that information. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
one? Yeah, there is one. <laughs> um, will all of this be available in real time for emergency managers? Yes, it will. We're actually a project funded by FEMA through the state of New York, and so all of that data will be made available in real time. So let me go through these briefly. I've covered some of it, but um, this is what is the Mesoscale Network. New York's not unique in the sense of there are about six or seven other states with statewide observing networks, and we've uh, learned a lot from those other states. We've actually bought a lot of the software from them. And you know, you may ask, well, why does New York need a mesonet? Well, Chris touched on this earlier. You know, climatologically in the last 50 years, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in the number of these high precipitation events. But there's another uh, aspect of this, and that is a study several years ago looked at the economic sensitivity of each state to weather. And they actually found that New York State was number one in the sensitivity of, of its economy to weather variability. And part of the reason is we have a lot of agriculture here, a lot of tourism. And so that makes us especially sensitive to weather. And so by increasing our weather observations, we can help improve our economic output. And so we're actually saving, or we'll have the potential to save the state a lot of money. And so when you look at the, at the federal observing network across the state, again, it's composed of weather radars, weather balloons, um, roughly 27 what we call ASOS sites across the state. But again, even combining that information, you're still missing a lot. And so you see the gaps in the, between the ASOS stations. There's a lot that can happen between those sites, whereas a much more dense network can help fill in a lot of those gaps. So a quick overview, I've mentioned some of this. It will we'll, uh, ingest something like a half million observations per day, and that's from collectively from across the state. Um, these stations will have an average spacing of about 20 miles and will collect data every five minutes. We'll actually have the potential to, to collect data every minute if there's something high impact going on at a particular location. And uh, we'll also have, uh, some of these sites will have these vertical component sensors as well as the snow sites. And again, we hope to complete the network by the end of next year. This is a quick map of what we uh, envision the network to look like by the end of next year. And uh, we will have, again, these 20 snow sites, 20 snow sites and the 17 what we call profiler sites. And this is sort of a close-up view of that. You'll see that uh, most of our snow sites are across the Adirondacks where the, the goal is to, to build something to complement an existing network across the Catskills. And we have these 17 what we call enhanced sites across the state um, to get a to provide the NWP models with the, the data they need in the vertical component. You'll also see we have a network of about five of these vertical profiling sensors right around New York City, and that's to help with some uh, dispersion modeling uh, that FEMA would like to do. So here's a list of that standard instrumentation that we plan to have. And, and you know, some unique aspects of, of this mesonet is the soil moisture. I'll have then a three level, something we, we don't currently get from, from any of the other networks. And um, as well as we'll have a camera at every site. And so we expect that will help us with understanding the snow pack uh, across the state as well as the uh, visibility in some ways, some conditions. This is an artist rendition of a site. This isn't actually a photograph, it's a, it's a drawing. But uh, this is very close to what the site will look like once it's installed. The only difference being we actually won't have guy wires on our towers. But other than that, it'll look, it's a 30 foot tower with a 30 by 30 uh, foot box area. The each site will run off solar power. And that's in case uh, if you're in a high impact uh, event, you're likely to use, lose utility power. And so each site will have a solar, will run off solar power. And each site will also run off cellular communications where that's available. Otherwise, we'll use some satellite comms. Here's just a sampling of some of the instrumentation. We have chosen a lot of instrumentation that uh, is rugged, can be outdoors for a long time, and can endure cold temperatures. New York's very cold. And uh, to sort of combat that, we've chosen a precipitation gauge that uh, can can measure both rainfall as well as snow and hail and sleet and all the winter precip. 
uh, this particular rain gauge is heated, heated around the collar um, so that it doesn't freeze up and reduce the, uh, the collection area. These are uh, the instrumentation we'd like to put at our enhanced sites. We actually haven't chosen a specific company yet, but we'll have what we call LIDARs and microwave radiometers at each site. Again, these will provide a vertical uh, sensing, vertical component measurement of both the wind, temperature, and moisture fields. And Everett will talk more about these in a minute. If you collected uh, your information from your LIDAR every second, this is what uh, some of that data would look like provides just incredible detail of, of, in this case, what we call the boundary layer, the, uh, the turbulence associated with uh, daytime mixing. What you see here from left to right is, is a 15 minute window of some of that mixing. And you see on a very fine scale, the updrafts and downdrafts going on within that boundary layer. This is uh, our 20 snow, snow sites. We'll, have, uh, we'll measure both the snow depth and what we call the snow water equivalent. And again, this is very um, valuable in case you're doing hydrological studies and uh, wanting to do some flood forecasting, particularly across, in our case, the Adirondacks. And one unique thing that we try and stress with the, the New York State Mesonet is the high quality of the data. There are a lot of networks out there. But we want to make sure that ours is the flagship in the sense of you can rely on our data. And we do a lot of different things to maintain that standard. We've put a lot of work into the site selection, and that makes a very big difference in the long-term um, trends in the data that you can expect to see. We have a team of field technicians that their entire job is driving around the state replacing sensors as they go bad. And we have a very extensive um, network of, of uh, calibration um, software that we use to um, uh, quality control the data. This is just a sampling of some of that, uh, those techniques and routines uh, that we use and uh, all of those on the left are all automated. So this is all done in real time with every piece of data that comes through. We treat each data as if it's bad and then we have to prove to ourselves that uh, that data is actually good. And so every piece of data has a flag associated with it. And um, you know, once we collect that data, we'll produce products and various analyses. And the plan is that we'll redistribute that data back out to various users. And with that, I'll stop and turn it over to Everett. We were going to ex accept collective applause, but uh, but one of the uh, one of the values of this system is really to improve the situational awareness of our forecasters and emergency managers. And I like Paul's point. Uh, there was a significant impact with respect to uh, Doppler radar in that respect, and this is sort of augmenting that, if you will, and to sort of uh, improve that situational awareness within the short term. Um, you know, for uh, forecasters and emergency managers. And here in New York, we're particularly tuning the system for uh, so with, our, with, our, with our soil moisture system and uh, with our snowpack system and with these vertical profilers that uh, Jerry talked about, we're particularly tu tuning our system to improve the situational awareness with respect to severe weather and also with respect to flooding. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna very quickly talk a little bit about, we're really excited about what we call these profiles, and uh, I'll dig, try to dig into the weeds a little bit, but not too much, um, to, to tell you why we're excited about it. And use that as an example to show how, to contrast the information forecasters have today uh, in, in a severe weather situation versus what they might have um, uh, when we have the profiles available and how that improves their situational awareness. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, how, how we, what we're thinking about in terms of getting the information to emergency managers and, and getting a public response. Uh, part of the ju justification for uh, this uh, profiling system came from this National Academy of Sciences study that was done a few years ago, and it was called Observing Weather and Climate from the Ground, ground Up. And it was a national study um, you know, by very uh, you know, accomplished scientists to really look at the national observing system. Uh, you know, it was assembled, again, by National Academy of Sciences, and it was basically a report to Congress and a report to federal agencies on how we can uh, sort of assess, so assess our national observing system and what improvements we can make to that system 
to improve the accuracy of uh, severe weather forecasts. And one of the things they concluded was, was that we needed to have information above the ground. If we look at our national observing system, uh, most of our observation, with the exception of the Doppler radar system, is really, you, you know, uh, two meters or so off the ground. And where they felt we were really lacking was in this area, say, about a mile or, or two up off the ground. And, and there was a lot of information there that we weren't getting in a real-time sense, uh, in a continuing sense, that sort of blind, uh, you know, caused our forecasters to be blind in a sense. Uh, and what they proposed was to, they proposed to Congress and to uh, federal agencies was to deploy 400 of these systems nationwide uh, at a spacing at about 50 kilometers or so, and to really focusing on measuring moisture uh, and winds. And so this is part of the rationale uh, that went into when we added this piece of the system, what we call profiles. And it distinguishes us. Uh, uh, Jerry talked about other mesonets across the, the country and even internationally. This particular piece, this profiler piece, really distinguishes us from the other systems that, that pre presently exist. And we like to say that it's a game changer. And we think within the, within the sense of our profilers. So uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, so it, again, I won't go into the weeds on it, but basically they're remote sensors based on, uh, on, on, on LiDAR technology and uh, microwave technology. And, and they allow us to probe uh, you know, about a mile or so up above the ground. Uh, and we get uh, relative humidity, wind, uh, temperature information. Next slide. So this, if you click it one more time. Oops, go back. Well, my, my movie isn't playing. Go back. Uh, what, what this is a, a, an image of is, a, is a, uh, the June 29, 2012 uh, ratio that uh, crossed uh, from the central US to the mid-Atlantic. And it was an extreme event resulting in significant damage, 22 uh, fatalities, uh, millions of uh, households without power for five days. It was a significant event. Uh, the picture was to show a propagation of that event using lightning data across the, across the, uh, across the country, but uh, apparently the movie isn't working. Uh, data we were taking uh, in Washington, D.C. showed that uh, you know, wind gusts during the, the event, when the event occurred in uh, Washington, D.C., were on the order of above 50, uh, uh, 60 to 70 miles an hour. Next slide. So that's a radar, radar composite showing the propagation of the event. Um, you know, it traveled and it's uh, something like uh, 600 miles in the order of uh, 10 hours. So it was a very significant event. Uh, it, was, it was highly unexpected. I know in the Washington, D.C. area, I was actually in Boulder flying back, and it caught people by surprise. 24 hours in advance, uh, there was no forecast on it. Uh, the, the, the forecasters began to pick up on it within, I think, within, within 12 hours. However, the public was, was relatively unaware. I mean, people were, were walking around Georgetown completely unaware of this event uh, occurring, and it was a significant impact. Next slide. So let me take you into the weeds with respect to how the, the information that a forecaster would, would have, uh, what they have now compared to what they would have uh, with, a, with a profiler system. It turns out that in the Washington, D.C. area, one of the microwave radiometers that we will deploy in our system was deployed during this event. And this is a plot, these are plots of data from that, um, from that system. The top plot is, is temperature up to about a half a mile into the, to the atmosphere. Um, and you can see that big temp temperature blob just before the, if you look sort of in the middle of the plot uh, is where the, um, the event occurred, arrived in Washington, D.C. What you're looking at is, is height versus time. And so uh, the left side of the plot is earlier on in the day and the right side of the plot is uh, later on in the day. And in the middle there where you see uh, this significant gradient of color uh, in all the plots is where the event occurred, arrived in Washington, D.C. So if you look at, focus on the middle, the middle graph there. And so the information that forecasters have today uh, represents those two stars. That middle plot, that middle plot represents information. One of the indices that forecasters look at to understand the instability of the atmosphere or the ability of the atmosphere to, to, to form and sustain storms. So it's an it's a in instability index. And when it's low, it means that the atmosphere is stable and can sustain these storms. And when it's really high, uh, it means that the atmosphere is, is unstable and can, can sustain, um, sustain these, uh, these, these severe storms. If you look at this, the star on the left and the star on the right, that's the information forecasters have today of that instability. So in a sense, they're blind. 
That's what this graph is really showing you. So at the beginning of the event, you see, a, you know, that, that's, more, that's, that's data from a radius on, and in the morning, the forecasters saw that that instability was very low, so the atmosphere was, 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 was relatively stable. Um, later in the afternoon, it's high. The profiler gives you that, that, that magenta-type curve is the information that the, profiler, the profilers give you. So as you can see, within a very short period of time, within two hours or so, that instability changed significantly from very low to very high. And had the forecasters had that information, they would have more situational awareness of this event occurring. So this is the type of information we think, uh, this is, this is what we, when, we say that, when we say these systems will be a game changer for that situational awareness, this is what we're, 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 we're talking about. Um, again, the systems will severe weather, particularly we, we think that we're really excited that we think that we're going to get more skill with respect to icing, fog around airports with respect to visibility, uh, for, with, with, uh, fog for aviation, visibility with, with, uh, for aviation, and also um, we'll have a, a, an ability also to predict in the event of fires or, or release of hazardous material, material, if you go to the next slide, we'll be able to, pr to predict on a short term where that material travels. Next slide. So what Jerry and I have really focused on, so this is a continuum, if you will. If you sort of look at the left side of the side, you see the, the, the observations, the tool, our tools, uh, the high quality data. Uh, the next, if you sort of the next arrow, you see the big computers. Underneath all this is a very sophisticated and very advanced uh, processing uh, system uh, for really turning that observation into meaning and meaningful information, which here we present um, to uh, emergency managers and forecasters. And you know where we are right now is we're really building from the observations to the analysis system. But there are other two parts of the system that we have our eye on. We're not working on explicitly at, at this point, but we have our eye on in terms of um, in terms of, of, of important components. And that's really how we communicate. And I think you know this morning we're all talking about this is how we convey this information to emergency managers. Um, and it's how they convey that information to the public and the public response. I think that's where, I think we're all sort of landing on the same place. That's where the gap is. Uh, I mean, this is, an ex this is a relatively expensive system um, and we're gonna produce great data, but if we don't close the gap, we don't close the gap, I, I think that um, we won't achieve what we call a resilient and responsive society. If you go to the next slide, uh, so the first part is how we communicate to emergency managers. Again, we're working on that, and it's not, again, it's not just about the, the data. There are other things you have to do. One of the things, borrowing from Oklahoma, Oklahoma has this, this, uh, this system they call OK First. Uh, and they, that's part and part or parcel of their me me mesonet system. And uh, if you go to the next slide, and part of that is training emergency managers. So they, 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 they get this great data, they get this great quality data, and they provide it to emergency managers. But as part of their system, what they do is they actually bring emergency managers uh, in over the course of the year and provide training to them to one, you know, how, to understand the data, understand the ingredients of severe weather, understand how you integrate all these data to make quick decisions. If you go to the next slide. And it's proven to be successful. They can show that you know, uh, emergency managers that have been trained to, in, to interpret this data uh, have saved lives. In the uh, May 3rd, 1999 uh, tornado, more torna tornado, first responders looking at this data um, were able to make quick decisions uh, in evacuating patients from hospitals just before a storm hit and saving, um, saving um, many, many, many lives. And so that's, that's, that's the critical piece. It's not just the data. It's how you convey the information. Uh, how, it's how you convey that information uh, in terms of um, graphical information, but it's also how you train people to understand and interpret that information. Last slide. Um, and the other piece of that is, is the public. Is, uh, is, is how the public, again, I think we're all talking about that with respect to, to how you convey probability information. It's uh, risk and response. And you, you know, I'm just adding to what is said already. We have an eye here at the University of Albany uh, in terms of bringing social, and Lance talked about it earlier, is bringing what we need to do, and we haven't done a good job of this, is bringing atmospheric scientists together with social scientists, economists, sociologists, psychologists, 
you know, bringing them together to really understand risk perception and, um, and risk response. And looking not only just, looking at demographics, um, there's some great stories that can be told about from past storms, for example, um, Katrina, where if you looked at different, diff different demographic of the population in Katrina reacted differently. Um, and so, it, it, so risk is not only, it's not, not monolithic. How people perceive risk and act is not monolithic. It's, it's, it, it's gender-based, it's race-based. Uh, and those are the things that we need to understand. And um, impact on first responders during these events. Uh, it goes to how they make decisions. Um, again, understanding and acting on uh, uh, uncertainty. Last, see, I got two more slides. So just to wrap up, um, uh, Jerry pointed out the, uh, uh, the site selection will be completed at the end of, um, the end of this year. Um, we'll begin uh, installation soon, and that'll be completed in uh, 2016. Uh, I, you know, as part of that soft piece, we're, we're, we're very aggressively going out and working with uh, collab uh, seeking collaborators to understand the public need, the need of agencies, and how can we, re we can be responsive to that in terms of serving uh, the state. Um, and then last slide, just information. Last slide. Thank you. Well, uh, Chris, I thank you for the opportunity to speak here at uh, today's forum. Uh, the Canal Corporation's uh, flood warning and optimization system is something that uh, we've been working rather hard on for the past uh, 15 months, and uh, we're going to give you a summary of really what that is. But uh, by way of background, uh, the New York State Canal Corporation is charged with operating, uh, maintaining, and promoting uh, the state's 400, excuse me, 524 mile canal system mainly the Erie Canal, the historic canal, the canal that uh, made New York City the empire, uh, made the state the empire state, New York City the uh, financial capital of the world. And we're still operating and maintaining that today. Uh, two weeks we'll be opening up our 191st uh, continuous a year of navigating, uh, navigation for the canal system. And uh, really the system we're operating right now has been in operation for the past 100 years. Uh, and essentially we're operating a uh, antique Rube Goldberg and uh, a lot of moving parts, uh, a lot of dams, uh, a lot of locks, and uh, the dis people who built the system, uh, the current uh, canal that we use, decided to transfer the canal from a static canal where uh, mules would pull the uh, barges to a riverine canal, a dynamic canal. So now we become uh, very, 100 years ago, became in the emergency management business and became intertwined with flooding because we're now uh, navigating in the river. Um, one of the things I was going to touch upon was, say, in the Mohawk River Basin, the uh, canal flood warning system is going to be in three different basins, and uh, the Upper Hudson River Basin from the Troy Dam North, the Mohawk River Basin, uh, and the Oswego River Basin. And uh, one of the challenges, if we just kind of jump ahead once you get going, shows uh, that uh, in the Mohawk River Basin, I believe we only have 13 uh, real-time uh, monitoring sites, uh, whether we're monitoring a stream flow, and it's awful tough to uh, uh, go ahead if you You're just showing some flood damages we've had recently with Hurricane. I mean, this really hit us hard. We had $85 million of damage uh, in the canal system with the Hurricane Irene and Lee in 2011 and just devastated our equipment. Here are that 24 real-time gauges. Uh, 13 of them exist in the Schoharie Creek, so along that Mohawk corridor where we're actually operating the system, we had some real limited situational awareness. So what we did was go ahead and in install 63 real-time gauges in this basin. And in total, I believe we're going to have, uh, throughout our three basins, uh, 105 uh, stage gauges, 22 real-time stream flow gauges, and 30 precipitation gauges. Really, to, uh, a term we've heard a lot has been situational awareness. We can't react to all the precipitation work that is being done by uh, the National Weather Service, the Mesonet Project, and others until we can really understand what's happening throughout our system because it isn't just rainfall. We're going to take that rainfall, transcend it into runoff, then we get into a stream, how hydraulically that uh, system moves throughout our watersheds. To touch upon quickly in the Mohawk River Basin, uh, you know, in, in here in the Mohawk Valley, a uh, system that was uh, installed with these movable dams, and uh, it's a great dam that we can actually take out in the wintertime so we're not uh, subject to spring flooding. Uh, we're not subject to uh, ice jam flooding, but uh, as an antiquated system that should, certainly wouldn't be built today. 
Uh, essentially, we have the uh, uh, superstructure you might see when you're driving along the throughway. We have uh, mules that raise and lower the gates. We have lower gates, upper gates, and uprights. And these systems are operated to essentially achieve the water levels that we need for navigation. Next slide. We have a, a two-foot navigation range. And uh, really what happens here is that we can either raise only the upper gates, and in doing so, to achieve that water level, uh, navigation level we're trying to do, create some challenges because historically we're, we are unable to raise the lower gates. What that has done is essentially created a real blockage in our flow and uh, hydraulic impacts and has really served to be a debris uh, catch these dams and it's a real challenge. Hopefully this video will play, maybe not. We can go on, just, we'll just use this essentially from looking downstream. This is really coarse bar racks, and we found out with Hurricane Irene and Lee that these caught full trees. It caught all sorts of uh, challenges, and everything that floated downstream caught up this and actually blocked the flow. So following the damage that we had in uh, 2011, we took it upon ourselves to look at options. And one of the options we had was to uh, modify these dams so we could actually raise the lower gates and uprights in anticipation of a major flood event to remove the hydraulic obstruction that has occurred historically so that we could uh, actually minimize the flood damages that took place not only to our infrastructure, but to the communities along the canal corridor as well. Here's some of the damage that took place, just from you know, an odd shot at Lock 10 in Cranesville that kind of shows how bad this flood really was. This was I chose this, chose this photo because, these photos, because this was the only photos we really had that were at peak when the flood wave moved out. This was uh, Hurricane Irene uh, probably around, uh, I think, 11 o'clock the next day. The sun was shining, as you can see. If uh, you were looking at it solely from a meteorological perspective, there was only, the rain was over but it was moving downstream and we didn't know how bad it was going to be. We didn't know when the peak was going to occur. We didn't know what the magnitude was going to be. And we didn't know what the, when the water was going to go down. And so we have uh, photos here that show just unbelievable damage. The photo on the uh, right shows uh, our upstream cab. That's a two-story uh, building right there. So we're flooded very badly. And then the photo next to it shows the damage where the actual debris came down, wrapped around the components of the movable dam, and actually destroyed it. I walked across this dam the next day. Actually, the water went down very quickly. And uh, our structural engineers did some analysis. And they said, the dam's unstable. Everyone stay off it. We're worried it's going to collapse. That's how bad a condition it was in. The flood peak at this location was 16.8 uh, feet above normal. Uh, it's just unbelievable when you compare it to a 500-year flood event. And uh, we know we didn't have a 500-year flood, but uh, with that uh, inability to remove the uh, lower gates and uprights and the, uh, all the debris that came floating into the area, it essentially blocked the channel and such uh, the water level was very high. If we were able to remove those uh, dams in anticipation of the event through all the hydraulic analysis we did, we could show a 10-foot reduction in the water surface profile, the peak observed flood, and uh, certainly FEMA was willing to flood this uh, program. Go on to the next one. So, so we talk about transitioning from you know, what we can do and what the benefits of doing such as, let me take a step back and look at what flood warning is. And in the past, historically, it's really been uh, you know, the Department of Public Works, local public servants going out and doing things like you know, filling sandbags, closing roads, and uh, making sure that the areas that are commonly flown, uh, prone to flooding are, uh, uh, are kept so people are off them, putting in uh, flood walls to uh, uh, prevent uh, rivers from overtopping. But what happens when we have an event like Irene or Lee when those flood walls overtop? Are we prepared for it? And uh, when we do road closures, are we we're closing the right roads? Do we really know when the water's going to peak? Do we know how high it's going to get? The National Service Weather Service did a great job in uh, dealing with this program starting back in 97 with the Advanced Hydrologic Prediction Service. They took uh, a lot of local data and on a national level, level took what information was available and started producing forecasts. And their forecasts are essentially what has been used and is the standard we're using even today because uh, they've been running the system for a long time. But to essentially take uh, the science that exists, knowledge in the precipitation runoff, and uh, provide forecasts that would actually uh, uh, give us an idea of 
when the water level is going to rise, a forecast of how high it's going to be, have some impacts of when we get to a level, is this a real problem? Are we at a major flood or is it just something that we can deal with? One of the challenges we have from an operational standpoint, both of these graphs here, one's at Freeman's Bridge on the right, the other one's up in Little Falls, exist within the eight movable dams that the Canal Corporation has uh, on the Erie Canal. So it's tough for us to make operational decisions with that uh, spatial limitations that exist with uh, uh, the AHIPS program. Also, uh, these are updated every six hours, and so we have a challenge with the data, what happens with uh, changes happen in between with uh, flash flooding and things like that. So it, it's uh, very good for a public warning from an operation standpoint. It makes it rather challenging. And snow melt, you know, it's always a challenge. You can get half a degree between difference between solid ice, uh, melting snow, and actual runoff. So we're trying to tackle those problems. Here's an uh, interface uh, of our uh, Mike customized system. We're using a uh, Danish Hydrologic Institute, a DHI's uh, Mike program to run our flood warning system. And uh, where we actually took uh, the basin, uh, Mohawk Basin, shown in this example, and actually took the watersheds that the National Weather Service used and actually made them on a much micro, much smaller station. And in putting in all these uh, stream gauges and all these uh, stage gauges were actually able to provide uh, a much better ability to uh, assimilate the data that's available and to be able to pr produce a forecast. Really we took the uh, precipitation that's available from the sources that are readily available and as the Mesonet program uh, comes up we want to integrate all that data into our uh, system so that we're able to actually uh, take that new information and other data sources come out we're able to integrate whatever happens from a precipitation standpoint so we can use that because precipitation drives everything. If we can't accurately uh, forecast what the precipitation is, it's very difficult to forecast what's going to happen once it hits the ground. Then we move into the hydrologic uh, perspective. We did a, a continuous model of each of our three basins so that we actually have a uh, unfragmented watershed that we can actually model and see how the water moves across it. Hydraulically, we used a Mike uh, 11 model, which is uh, different than the US models, the HEC models that have been done. We did it for quite a few reasons, but there's some real horsepower with the system that we're able to use to be able to, once the rip flows get into a river and environment, how we can track, model, and forecast those systems. And this here is the Mike uh, customized real-time interface. So it'll be a point-and-click system for operations, people to go in and look at the system and uh, make our forecast uh, at the points that we desire. Essentially, for the Mohawk Basin right now, I think there are six or seven uh, AHIP sites in this, and we're going to go up to, I believe, 40 sites of forecast points for the Mohawk Basin. So we really want to increase our situational awareness and produce forecasts in locations where we really need to produce them to operate our system properly. In general, here's kind of really what the overall system is. We've really improved our situational awareness by uh, adding this real-time uh, monitoring, so we really have that uh, ability to really know what's going on as the system changes. We're not left in the dark. When the sun sets, we're not sitting well. We really don't know what's going on. We're improving our weather forecasting, we're really improving our frequency, a real tall uh, order, and we appreciate the work of the National Weather Service and uh, Dave Valley and his group to be able to assist us in that program. We're developing basin-wide models, so we are ending that fragmented approach. Uh, in the past, we had models that were done for a certain uh, sub-watershed, a certain stream, but we're bringing that in a holistic for, uh, standpoint so we can actually use these, this tool that we have and make accurate predictions. <coughs> tremendous, much like with uh, the Mesonet project, tremendous uh, amount of data management that's going on, and it's a real challenge for us as we're learning to deal with this uh, real-time data coming in, and it never stops, and we need to be able to verify it and uh, put it into our system. We're integrating our forecasting with the National Weather Service. We certainly don't want to be out putting out a forecast that's different than what there is. We have continuity of messaging. So we're working hand in hand with the National Weather Service. We want to be able to present the information in the graphical uh, interface that the public can actually use. We're going to have a public website so they can go in and see. Here's what the water is. We're all comfortable using these tools right now to point and click to show what's really going on in our system. We're going to do uh, dynamic flood inundation uh, mapping, essentially not only showing, uh, as the National Weather Service shows, of how high the water gets, well, but what areas are inundated? Is the water inundated? How uh, our critical infrastructure, are they impacted in, in that uh, standpoint? What is the uh, uh, challenge with uh, dealing with things like evacuation routes and the timing of evacuations? 
And ultimately, one of the biggest components we're putting is the system optimization. We want to work with our uh, cooperators, our collaborators, and our operators to say, what if we can make different changes in how we regulate all of our water control structures to minimize flooding? At the same time, we want to look at, let's do precipitation uh, uh, simulations to say, suppose this uh, predicted uh, forecast moves 10 or 20 miles to one way or the other, and look at different scenarios to say, how should we handle that? And our goal is pretty simple, to <coughs> minimize flooding by giving the public, giving emergency managers uh, to, uh, assessment of really what's happening in these watersheds. We certainly don't have any uh, lack of collaborators and cooperators that we're working with here. Certainly the Mesonet, uh, we work hand in hand with them. New York City with the programs that they're doing in the Upper Schoharie and uh, a whole host of others. And uh, I don't mean to pass by anybody, but it's been a, a working uh, relationships that we have that really makes this program a success. Our schedule was a very aggressive schedule, like an 18 month schedule to get this done and we're nearing the uh, final steps of our implementation right now. I have a Mohawk system is running, my uh, Upper Hudson is running, uh, ready to go into a beta version right now and my Oswego River Basin will be done by the end of June. And once we finish those, we want to put them through a six month uh, verification and validation uh, process so we can ensure that we're providing accurate uh, formative forecasts to the public. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. So we do have time for a few questions. And if there are questioners, please again go to the microphone and identify yourself, sir. I'm Rich Lemansky from uh, Town of Clifton Park. I'm on the CERT team. I'm also on the search and rescue team. I've been involved in some emergency management. Uh, the question I have regarding specifically on uh, Doppler radar forecasts. There's a lot of computer uh, programs and even phone apps I see out there now that people are using showing not only the position but the intensity of rain showers year, or hours beyond. And I just really put very little validity in this. Is there, what, are the, what are the algorithms? How can they possibly predict where something is going to be many hours or 24 hours in advance using Doppler radars? And is there anything useful that we could use out of this? Um, I can't speak specifically to certain apps that you may find in terms of uh, precipitation potential and the future of Doppler radar. I think what you can do um, more than anything is go back and look at the history of that particular storm and see what uh, using uh, some of the algorithms the Doppler radar produced and ultimately came up with when, um, when oh, looking back at the storm in its last hours and then kind of project that out. Um, I'm not sure what products are out there that go forward in time in terms of Doppler radar. I'm sorry I didn't answer your question specifically, but that's my knowledge about the Doppler radar is what's going on now and what it saw, not what it's going to see. Uh, yeah, I think this underscores the value of the kind of program they have in Oklahoma where they have training available uh, to emergency managers to look at this type of data and um, be able to on the fly um, uh, interpret what they're seeing and so um, you know that's something I think um, we need to look at in New York at, at doing a similar thing and, and really where we're going with weather radar right now we have what's called worn on detection and so emergency managers will look at a radar screen and they'll interpret what's going on currently and there'll be some now casting involved of projection of projecting the next 10 20 30 minutes out but that's just linear extrapolation where we're headed is what's called worn on forecast. And so fairly soon what you'll see is a combination or, or merging of that radar data with very high resolution NWP models. And so fairly soon I, I believe the weather service will start actually begin issuing warnings based on that forecast which is really a merging of that radar and NWP model. And so while right now it's worn on detection, which is the way it's always been done, I think you'll see a fundamental change in that, in the way we go about issuing warnings, I would say in, within the next one to two decades. You're good, thank you. Other questions? Okay. Hi, 
Hi, Kate Moss in Geography and Planning. Paul, this is for you. I really love what you're doing with the stochastic probability models for the public, but we really need that for our workforce. So I would encourage the researchers in the room here to think about the way that we can get a more agile workforce, that if you can tell us if we're shipping freight, if we're gonna have to be doing field work, if you can give us those heads up probabilities of your weather forecasts, we can look at what in our workforce flow is gonna be a threshold or what the probabilities are that that could affect what we wanna do. I think we could get some economic benefits out of that. It's gonna be a, a big project, but I think we have the talent to do that, and I think the state would appreciate it, because if Chris is at all right, we're not done with this. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and my issue is that I'm, I'm given such a short time to present this stuff to the public, and, and uh, the people who are watching are from all different walks of life who do so many different things. That's why I keep my stuff as simple as possible, and, and it's probably too broad brushed for any one specific thing, but uh, that's why I just keep that impact high and, and try to relate it to the largest swath of people that are possible. But I'd be more than happy to uh, take individual situations for people who have projects and things that are going on and, and, and try to relate it to their specific uh, interests and, and, and give percentages or probabilities uh, based on that. So you can contact me independently for that if, if I can't get it on television. Okay, okay. One of the one of the limitations to that I think will change um, uh, shortly is uh, the way it's the warning and watch system that's presently presently in place by the Weather Service. It, it, you know, I think Lance pointed pointed out this morning is very deterministic. Uh, it's also not dynamic. Um, you know, in the Weather Service itself right now, there's research going on. You know, over time to roll out a more dynamic, more deterministic, a more, more probabilistic. Uh, and dynamic in time and space. So in other words, they could pinpoint a watch warning, um, you know, at a, at a higher resolution and uh, a higher temporal re resolution. And as that comes online, because, you know, what you're talking about really should be based on information coming from the Weather Service. You know, not as, you know, like Paul pointed out, there may be one, you know, model out there that's, that's doing something. It should not be based on that. So the, these decision support, these stochastic decision support system, should really be based on information come up, coming from the National Weather Service. And as they modernize their watch warning system to be more dynamic, because they can now, you know, um, they have the, the technology to do that. As it becomes more dynamic in space and time, then we can build these more, um, these decision support systems uh, for the workforce. And I, I think that it'll liberate that when that, that occurs. Any other questions? Sir, please. <coughs> Hi, Mark Lowry, State Department of Environmental Conservation Office of Climate Change. And I think my question is related to communication, so it goes primarily to Mr. Cayano. So thank you for taking it. Um, we know that no specific climate or weather event can be attributed directly to climate change, but we know that every weather event now takes place in the context of a warming climate. And severe weather events are opportunities to talk about the impact of a changing climate on severity and frequency of those events, especially into the future, yet I rarely hear, if ever, in this market at least, TV meteorologists taking advantage of those teachable moments. So my two-part question to you is, why is that and who will be brave enough to be the first? <laughs> That's two very good questions. Um, I would say the why, again, I'm going to go back to time, and, and I hate to just sort of punt, but uh, in this area, first of all, I don't claim to be an expert in climate or climate change. I do have uh, some knowledge, but um, again, my area of, of specialty is more in, a, in, in forecasting and basically in the short term, which would be a synoptic forecast out to five to seven days. So uh, that's, that's one part of it. But another part of it also is, is the political end of it. Um, personally, what I try to do when I'm on television is, is go right down the middle and appeal to everyone. And you saw in my presentation that um, uh, people need a certain amount of trust to uh, decide who they're going to watch and get their information from. And I think in this environment, if you start showing that you're on 
one side or another, no matter how compelling the evidence may be, then you're starting to, and, and I've heard from the public on all different kinds of, of in, in all different areas, they won't watch anymore. And I think that, not that I purposely avoid it, but I do try to stick to the short term and, and uh, forecasting and what's going to impact people in that time frame in the, in the now casting out to the, the seven day forecast. In terms of climate change, I have been on uh, various uh, programs uh, related to it that aren't specifically uh, newscasts. We have a forum show that airs on Sunday mornings on News Channel 13 where I've gotten a little bit more involved in that type of stuff. So it's probably less likely that you're gonna, going to see that within the body of a weather cast on, on the news. Um, in these serious events, maybe in the aftermath, we can, we can probably go as far as uh, mentioning this stuff to, to, to make teachable moments uh, for, for our viewers. But uh, the last thing I want to do is get on a soapbox, because I think that's sort of, I mean, while, while, while one subset of the audience uh, is going to be interested, I think you turn off a subset of the audience as, as well, if for no other reason than people just want the forecast. <laughs> that's what I hear more than anything. Just tell me if it's going to rain, right? That's what we had so, uh, earlier. So um, I guess in conclusion, I would say that we can, we can delve into this stuff a little bit, but I, I think that within the body of a newscast, you're probably not going to see much of it um, outside of regular news stories. Is there a final question? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you have found this information useful. It has been a public service to the people of this great state of New York. And I'm pleased to announce that we at the Rockefeller Institute and the Department of Atmospheric and Environmental Sciences here are recommitting ourselves to continue this partnership as an annual event designed to look at severe weather trends for the year ahead. We sincerely hope that all of our campus partners and perhaps more of the institutions around the SUNY system will join us next year. In closing, I would like to recognize the following groups, and they did do much. Could they please stand up and be recognized as I call them? First, the university's IT staff and Mike on sound over there, the staff of the Campus Center, of course, our colleagues at the Department of Atmospheric and Environmental Sciences, and my partner on the road, Chris Thorncroft, who did so much to make this possible. The staff in the President's Office, the Government Relations Office, and the Office of Marketing and Communications, Level 3 and First, uh, first Light doubled the university's bandwidth during the course of this program to allow this and just as quickly as they doubled it, the students ate it up. <laughs> the staff of, uh, at the Rockefeller Institute, my colleagues, I'm very, very pleased uh, keep, keep always it, right? to do events with them. They did fantastic. And again, our colleagues at Cisco, Mike Ladd and Matt Heffler, who really uh, stood si side by side with us, and Evan Berry in Orlando to make this possible. A round of applause for all of them, please. Our, our, our presenters are actually going to be here for a few minutes, and if you'd like to talk to them offline, I'm sure that they would welcome your questions. Thank you for your kind attention this morning. We look forward to seeing you at our next program, and please be safe in your travels home and enjoy the weather. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem.